Hey folks, I'm Chris and I'm your Commander Mechanic. I had an anonymous Twitter user ask me while I was theory crafting my Jaxus the Troublemaker infinite combo linked up top if I viewed creating these combos like solving an algebraic equation and that kind of shook me because of how true it is. If we want to combo with Jaxus, let's take a look at what she needs to combo, to activate her ability and return to a neutral end state where we can activate her again. We need to be either neutral or positive on resources. What do we need to start? Well, we need our commander in play. Easy. We'll call Jaxus C in our combo. Our end state, what we're solving for, a return to starting position with enough resources to loop again, will be X. She has to tap, so we need to find a way to untap her. Let's call that Y in our equation. She requires us to discard a card, so let's call that Z in our math. She costs us one red mana to activate, so let's represent that resource in our equation with A. And, of course, we require a creature to copy. Let's call that B in our equation. The only known factor in the equation is the card that we want to break, our commander. Now, with these in mind, we need to get to a state where we've recouped everything that we've spent, all permanents are to a state where they can be used again, and ideally we've netted something. Mana, cards, damage, life. That's a loop. Now, if that's the case, we can insert other knowns for what factors are needed to combo. In this example, we need mana to activate Jaxus, a way to untap Jaxus, a card to discard to her ability, and a creature to target. So that turns our algebraic equation from C equals X minus Y minus Z minus A minus B into Jaxus equals loop minus untap minus discard minus mana minus creature. If I haven't lost you yet, stay tuned. Now, as we are starting to find parts for this, we can start solving our equation. Interestingly, we may find a few pieces that overlap and allow us to solve for multiple parts at once. Let's start with Combo Stalwart Thornbite Staff as our way to solve for untapping Jaxus. This introduces a new aspect in that we need a death trigger to untap Jaxus, and our equation becomes this. Jaxus plus Thornbite Staff equals loop minus discard minus mana minus creature minus death trigger. Now, since the copy Jaxus creates draws us a card when it dies, we can have the card we need to discard, and that changes our equation to this. Jaxus plus Thornbite Staff equals loop minus mana minus creature minus death trigger times discard. And if we can find a creature that makes mana, we can evolve our equation further. Jaxus plus Thornbite Staff equals loop minus mana times creature minus death trigger times discard. This gives us a few options. We could fulfill the creature that creates mana option with any creature that makes mana on enters the battlefield or dying. Bonus points if we can stay on color. So Priest of Urabrask is a great option here. It makes us three mana on enters the battlefield, meaning as we loop, we would be netting two mana each time, spending only one mana to reactivate Jaxus. Wily Goblin actually works here too, making a treasure on enters the battlefield, gives us just enough mana to continue activating Jaxus. And Impulsive Pilferer works too, as we'll be needing death triggers to make a treasure when the copy dies, and that'll net us enough mana to continue. If we use Priest of Urabrask, we actually end up making more than we need to loop, and that changes our equation to the following. Jaxus plus Thornbite Staff plus Priest of Urabrask equals loop minus death trigger times discard plus two mana. You can see that now we've got an end state where we loop and net mana. That's a huge bonus because it means we can funnel that mana into a win con. We go beyond loop and into win as our potential end state. We can take that a step further too. As we solve for our need for a death trigger, which draws us a card, we could use a piece that gets us further value, like, say, one of the altars. Altar of Dementia lets us sacrifice a creature to mill an opponent. This isn't necessarily a win con, though, as since we draw a card every loop, we're limited by the number of cards we have in our library. Phyrexian Altar lets us sacrifice a creature to generate a mana of any color, upping the mana we net per loop to three. And Ashnod's Altar does the same, but generates two colorless mana per loop, upping our bonus mana generation to a whopping four mana per loop. 
If we use Ashnot's altar in our equation, we end up with the following. Jaxus plus Thornbite Staff plus Priest of Urabrask plus Ashnod's Altar equals Loop plus Colorless Colorless Red Red. But that's a four card combo. It wins the game, we can go nearly infinite with it, we can return to our end state and continue the loop, but can we make this even more efficient? Is there a single creature that can help us solve for more parts? Bust out that encyclopedic knowledge of magic or just pop on over to Scryfall and use your Google Foo to find a creature like Atsushi the Blazing Sky. This is a very recently printed creature, so it's fresh in our minds, but in the context of combo, it might not be. Being legendary, Atsushi needs to follow the legendary rule. If you control two copies, you need to sacrifice one as a state-based effect. Since Jaxus doesn't stipulate we can't target a legendary creature, and Atsushi makes three treasures when he dies, this fulfills four factors of our equation in one card, leaving us with bonus mana. It changes our equation to this. Jaxus plus Thornbite Staff equals loop minus creature times mana times discard times death. And then we solve for it to this. Jaxus plus Thornbite Staff plus Atsushi equals loop plus red red. Then if we want to take it a step further and turn this loop into a win, we need another piece of the puzzle. That's not difficult and we don't need to factor it into our equation since the draw a card part of the death trigger on our token helps us cycle through our deck to find anything we want. And the bonus mana made from the treasures means we aren't lacking the tools to cast it. Our win con can be any burn spell that we filter our extra mana into. Comet Storm, Fireball, or Crackle with Power. We basically draw our entire deck one card at a time with the loop so we can draw the following conclusion on our equation. Jaxus plus Thornbite Staff plus Atsushi equals win. Simple, right? <laughs> really, I'm kidding. This kind of stuff breaks my brain and keeps me up at night. And the interesting part? It keeps getting more and more difficult. Before we get into that, I want to take a moment and thank my sponsor, Moxfield. They are hands down the best deck building platform ever, and I could not do what I do without them. Being able to assemble the multiple decks that I build in a regular week without them would just be insanity. Being able to search Scryfall from a deck builder, being able to sort cards by price, by mana value, and by sorting them by custom tags too, it just makes my life so much easier. If you want to make sure that I take a look at your decks, be sure to pop on over to Moxfield, linked in the description below, sign up, and follow my profile there too for all of the decks that I build here. Send me your decks in a Moxfield link and I will absolutely take a look. Recently, Magic senior designer Gavin Verhey released a video on his channel, Good Morning Magic, I'll link it up top and in the description, about how design is taking combos in Commander into account and trying their damnedest to prevent one card combos with Commanders. The new motto seems to be, if you're going to combo, you're going to work for it. This just means fewer, or no, 1.5 card combos anymore. By 1.5 card combo, I mean one card plus your Commander. Combos like Salvala Heart of the Wilds and Umbral Mantle, or Godo Bandit Warlord plus Helm of the Host. There are some key phrases to look for on cards, specifically legendary creatures, that really emphasize this new design ethos. Take a look at Tameshi Reality Architect from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty and you'll see a few examples. Phrases like this ability triggers only once each turn and activate only as a sorcery are big red flags that say that design and development saw opportunities for this creature to create loops and combos and they needed to shut it down by adding these qualifiers. This is to prevent you from benefiting over and over again, from looping. In my previous example with Jaxus, they tried to do the same, costing a mana, requiring her tapping, and requiring her ability to discard a card are all limiting factors, but without the qualifiers of once per turn, the wheels really come off. In a classic example, let's look at the Gitrog monster. The big frog here has a limiter in his ability as well, but that hasn't stopped him from being powerful, just from being completely broken. It's his last ability that's the real factor here. Whenever one or more land cards are put into your graveyard from anywhere, draw a card. 
In this case, it's the one or more limiting factor that prevents us from going off the rails with him. Can you imagine if we just drew a card for each land that was put into the graveyard from anywhere? We'd have scapeshift Gitrog decks drawing their entire libraries every turn. We'd have players milling massive chunks of their libraries all at once, drawing a card for every land put into the yard. And this is an easy example to point out. Not even a recent one, but one that you know was put in place because development was able to crack the card wide open. Another recent example is Cormella Glamour Thief from Streets of New Capenna. The blue-black-red vampire rogue reads, Haste. One tap. Add blue-black-red. Spend this mana only to cast instants and sorcery spells. When Cormella Glamour Thief dies, return up to one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. There's huge potential to loop this ability. She has haste innately, she makes mana, and she recoups a spell that has waiting to be broken all over it. Except for the clause, spend this mana only on instant and or sorcery spells. If Cormella could spend that mana on anything, then she would have a one and a half card combo with Twin Flame. How? Well, we activate Cormella, use the mana to cast Twin Flame, targeting Cormella, netting one mana, since we only use two to cast Twin Flame. We make a token copy of Cormella, sacrificing the original to the legendary rule and using her dies trigger to return Twin Flame to our hand. Now, if we weren't limited to using that mana only on instants and sorceries, we could use the one floating mana to activate the new token Cormella, resulting in a loop of infinite Twin Flames, infinite Cormellas entering the battlefield, and infinite Cormellas dying. Add in any aristocrat effect like a blood artist and it's game over. But that clause, that one little rider on the one little ability, shuts the whole thing down. Be on the lookout for the only as a sorcery, once per turn, one or more, or spend this mana only on riders on cards. Pay attention to abilities that require creatures to tap, or require mana to activate. No more kiki jiki mirror breaker with zealous conscript combos. No, design and development are actively keeping their eyes on these interactions, which requires a vast knowledge of Magic's history, along with some foresight into Magic's future. And honestly, that's a good thing. Cards can be strong without being broken, and not everything has to be broken. That doesn't mean I won't enjoy trying though, and that doesn't mean you won't keep seeing combo primers and shorts from me here on the channel. It just means that there are many more hoops to jump through. Think about this the next time you see a 5-6 to six card combo on the channel. These are the lengths your mechanic has to go through to break something before we fix it. If this is a new era of design, with cards being specifically designed for commander and combo potential in mind, then I welcome it with open arms. It makes it all the more satisfying when we manage to come up with slick combos involving commanders. Bring on the challenge! I hope you enjoyed this kind of video, and I want to keep doing more like this about brewing and deck building and theory. So if you've enjoyed it or any of my recent videos on alternate ways to build decks, please consider supporting the channel any way you can. Even just subscribing helps me greatly. But I've got a Patreon as well, and you can follow me on Moxfield too. All are linked in the description below. And of course, as always folks, good luck and have fun.